let's do that. I, I can. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, so let me just firstly give you an overview of the functionality. Um, and I'll just I'll just do a quick demo of what what we have so far, and then what we can do is um. Uh, th then then I can quickly walk you through the code. Okay, and because you understand the code base so well, I don't think it will it will take too long. <laughs> but but uh, let's 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 go through it anyway. Um, so basically, um, the idea behind uh, GitLab Workspaces is that uh, you should be able to spin up a, a workspace so that you can do your development. Um, and if you see uh, what we expect in the future is that our uh, you know every repository will have this dev file or YAML, which kind of defines what your um, just refresh here and make sure it's working. Uh, which defines what uh, what your thing looks like, okay? What your environment will look like. So in this case, if you see, we've got a very simple dev file, uh, which basically all it has is, is this image, right? And it talks about uh, that this is basically just a Golang latest image. It does nothing special. And um, and what we, we can define is some things like, you know, how much memory you want, how much CPU you want, things like that. Uh, the other thing you can define in your dev file is also which endpoints you want to open up. So if you want to open up ports, because let's say I'm doing web development and I want to test out things by by opening up a port, I can do that, right? So uh, so these are things you define in the dev file. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard of dev files uh, because we've been talking about it quite a lot. Um, and so uh, you could see that uh, I've also got this new workspaces screen where you could see a list of your workspaces. And there's currently nothing. Uh, so from this repository, because I have... Um, hopefully this agent running. Um, and you can see this agent's connected and running. And um, because I have this agent connected, I can go ahead and start, create a workspace. Uh, so all I need to do there, there is just say create workspace. I give it a ref um, of the repository to create the workspace from. So I select main in this case. And I'll also select a IDE to inject uh, if I don't have an IDE already uh, in the in the image that I'm using. So I'm going to just say inject uh, VS code because here I'm using a standard kind of Go image. Um, and so I can go ahead and say open VS code. And so that's going to inject VS code. So what this does is it starts the provisioning process. So as you can see, it's created this workspace 40 and it's going to start provisioning this workspace. Um, if I keep refreshing the screen, you can see that the status keeps changing and it keeps reflecting what is there in Kubernetes. Okay, so if I actually go to um, my Kubernetes um, if I look at Kubernetes itself, um, uh, so if I say, okay, uh, actually, let me just show you the namespaces. So it creates a new isolated namespace for this workspace. If I go into that namespace and I say, okay, get po, you can see that I'm actually creating um, a, a, a pod, which is now running. Um, and okay, get, uh, if I say deployment, you'll see that there's a corresponding deployment, there's a, there's a service. Right, so we create a bunch of objects like that. We create, uh, we create uh, this this service. We create a bunch of uh, other services for open ports. We create um, something for SSH as well, which is uh, a bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, and then we also create like an ingress object. So we create a bunch of objects uh, to support the workspace. Right. So now, if I go back to my uh, workspace here and I refresh my screen. Uh, what you can see is that the workspace is now running. It reflects what's in Kubernetes. I can go ahead and open the workspace. Um, now, as I'm opening the workspace, I go through this authentication uh, routine. Now, uh, this screen will kind of go away, but basically uh, it asks us to sign in so that, you know, if, if I'm if I am not the user who's created the workspace, I shouldn't have access to the workspace. So we go through that authentication authorization. Um, and once that happens, I'm in my workspace. And as you can see this, because I selected VS code as my IDE, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrown into VS code. Uh, from here, I can go ahead, uh, because you're also attaching, I didn't show you that, but we are attaching persistent volumes uh, so that you can access, uh, so you can store your uh, actual um, code, right? So I can go to this basic Go example. I can click OK. Uh, that should open up my repository. And then from my repository, I can go ahead and start a new terminal. And then I've got this very basic sort of Go program here. If you see, it just says, hello, go, GitLab. So I can just say, go run main.go, and that would just say, hello, GitLab. Oops. Um, I think I don't have Go on the path here for some reason. So let's go user. Oops. Hmm. Strange. 
I don't know why Go is not in the path, but basically it, it, it should give you access to Go. And when you say Go run main go, it should just work. Um, I may have made some changes recently because of which it, it's it's messed up the uh, path. Uh, but otherwise, um, you know, you basically have whatever is installed on the image um, and, and, and you should be able to run the code. Uh, you can also do things like, uh, you can also pre-install extensions and things like that if you wanted to. Uh, so if I wanted to install the Go extension, for example, I could do that. Um, so that I don't have to say, so everything comes kind of pre-installed. So that's the basic functionality. Now, uh, there's also like additional functionality of we can do web development, so I can open up ports and things like that. Uh, so that's also also possible with this. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's the basic functionality. The other things we can do, like change the state of the workspace. So, so right now it's running, I'm being charged for this workspace, you know, when we actually start charging for usage and things like that. I can go ahead and stop my workspace at any time. So if I go stop, my workspace and start um, refreshing my screen. You can see the status is stopped. If I actually go into Kubernetes um, and I say okay, get pull, um, and what's that? You can see it's terminating, right? So it, it goes ahead and starts terminating that uh, that uh, workspace. Um, let's give it a few seconds and see if it actually terminates fully. Um, Maybe it's waiting for your editor to attach something like that no no it'll just it'll, it, it's, okay. it injects it and it, it, it should detach as well um it just does uh to to install the editor all we do is run an init container which installs the editor um so so that shouldn't be a problem so now it's if you see it's terminated fully um and and if you see here it should yeah it should change the status of stop that means it's fully kind of uh, terminated right um so uh so that's one thing so we are obviously looking at the status in um, uh, you know, from from uh, from uh, Rails, you should be able to fire events to be able to change the status. So I'm doing start, but I can also terminate, for example, so I could completely remove that workspace. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to also enable was if I did actually, um, uh, you know, if I, if I were to change the state in Kubernetes, for example, for this deployment, I have the replica set to zero. Yeah, so the the deployment replica set to zero. So if I set it to one here, yeah, and so now the state in Kubernetes has changed, and this could be, for example, a node became unavailable, my workspace got disabled, or whatever, but now it's again running. So you know, we wanted to reflect the state in Kubernetes in of the workspace. So you can see now it says starting up. So because I changed the state in Kubernetes, it reflects that same state of the developer workspace in 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 Rails as well. So that um, you know, we, we are always reflecting the right state, and this is going to be useful in the future when we do things like usage and billing, right? If you do uh, usage with billing, you know how much how much time is actually up, or we're only charging for that much, and so those things, um, the, you know, we, we need to be able to enable those use cases. Uh, so now you can see it's running, um, and and um, if I say okay, get pull now, you can see the the workspace is back up and running. Right. Uh, same for termination. So if we were to terminate this workspace, we could just go ahead and hit terminate. Uh, and what this does is it just cleans up all the resources. Uh, so as you can see, it's in terminating status. It's not fully terminated yet. And if I say namespace this time, you can see that that workspace 40 namespace is now in a terminating state. So it's cleaning up the resources. As soon as the CPU resources are cleaned up, we will um, fully terminate and it says terminate. Right, so once the uh, once the deployment and CPU is 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 released, we will fully terminate and say it's terminated. Um, does that does that make sense just in terms of overall functionality? Yeah, that's, I think it's really cool. I like it. <laughs> okay, I'm glad. great I'm job. Glad I'm glad. Um, all right, so let me just walk you through the code itself. Um, <clears throat> So I've got. Uh, let me reduce this. Can you see this okay, oh, by the way? Can you see the code okay? Is it visible or no? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm, I'm muted, yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, all right, so I'll just start from server.go. Um, I think that that's the most useful part of the uh, the thing. Uh, I'll get into some some details, and I think this this first part which I want to talk to you about is perhaps the most controversial. 
um uh, but but yeah we can we can discuss like better ways to make this happen so the first thing is that on the rail side um it's very simple we fire events and those events basically are sent to um uh, sent to cas right and the way we do that is by this uh, this grpc method called create event and create event basically is exposed through that uh, the the cas grpc gem and so uh, in in rails itself we have um this method here, which just triggers off an event. Um, and, and basically based on the event, we we set the status of, of things. But basically what we do is call this create event, grpc event, which is exposed in that um, in that gem. Okay, uh, so for mm -hmm. all these events, so start, stop, terminate, it's basically an event triggered from Rails. Um, and that's basically making a grpc call to, uh, to CAS, okay, um, via that gem. So that's that's where this this kind of I'll show you the proto definition maybe that will help as well. Um, so uh, the proto definition we've got three methods in the proto. Uh, one's um, one, the first one which which I'm talking about right now is this create event mm -hmm. uh, method. And it's a unary um, call which makes a request and gets a response back. Um, and similarly, uh, we've got some other calls which I'll get into. Uh, but one is the call from the uh, from uh, agent K. So this this create event this happens from um, from Rails into CAS. Get work is the API which is called from agent K into um, uh, agent K into CAS, and then update work 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 workspace status is called from uh, agent K into CAS as well. And this is basically to update the statuses of things. Um, uh, so mm -hmm. so the, the, basically the, these are the three uh, core events. Um, now let's talk about the create event. That's sort of where things start. Uh, so create event is when we get a request uh, to create event, and this event could be create a workspace, stop a workspace, whatever. Um, and and if you see the actual definition of the event of that, um, so you actually see the uh, definition of the request. It's quite simple. Uh, so all it's got is it's got some information about which domain to in invoke it on, which uh, sorry, uh, what event type it is, which workspace it's for, and and some uh, generic payload details. And this payload is basically a JSON encoded uh, payload information. And so that that's what it's sent here. Along with that, some other other information like oh, what's the ID to inject, and you know what what workspace it is, what the ID is, and things like that. Um, so so that that's that's what is in the base event request. Um, so that is where server go comes in. So um, so it, it handles create event from Rails. Uh, it marshals that event into a string. And all it does is it publishes that event to a, a Redis queue, right? So it puts this into a Redis queue. Um, and it's doing, uh, it's just doing an R push into Redis uh, to get the, uh, to actually push the details in, into, into Redis. Um, and, and what it does is it creates one, um, one event queue per agent. So based on the agent ID, uh, we have like a separate, uh, separate queue so that, you know, uh, agents are not getting like the wrong messages from each mm -hmm. other. Um, so we've gotten uh, a queue per agent basically. Um, and so what we're doing is we're doing a R push into that and that goes, uh, and that's pretty much it. That's the end of the event cycle. So this is just the event has been written into um, Redis and we stop there. Um, I had a question here. Yeah, is there a chance that there will not be Redis and then I have to, have to um, uh, uh, go to channels or use channels instead of Redis? Uh, is there cache deployments where Redis is optional? No, it's mandatory. We need it. Okay, okay, so that's fine. Um, because I was thinking in case that is not there, then fallback would be um, to use uh, like a channel to just um, transfer if you're using yeah. like a single instance cache. Um, okay, so once that is done, so once it's in Redis, uh, the second sort of cycle continues. Uh, so this is um, simultaneously agents are coming up, right? So agents come up and they invoke this get work API. Um, so get work is basically the grpc call um, from so this is uh, so this grpc call is from agent k into mm -hmm. uh, uh, into gas mm -hmm. and if you see this is a streaming event so um, so when when agent k makes a request it gets uh, it gets multiple responses back 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, and each response is basically just uh, uh, basically an event, right? So saying, hey, here's something, apply this, here's something, apply this. And basically that's what we we send it to this. So most of the logic of what to sure. apply is- One second, sorry. No, no worry. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, uh, so we're calling this, uh, so we're getting the agent info, so we're getting the agent ID, which is important because we then listen to that queue. As soon as this get work is called, um, Cast then starts listening to the queue to send messages to the agent. Yep. Um, so it uses the same Redis key to be able to send. Mm -hmm. um, and then once that happens, um, I'm just using a, a Go template and I'll show you that later um, to be able to basically figure out what um i'm using a go template just to figure out how to send a request um uh, is to form form the thing that needs to be applied okay mm -hmm. so uh, i'll show you what that go template looks like uh, slightly after uh, but basically i start this infinite loop um uh, this infinite loop basically keeps trying to pop them uh, blocking pop uh -huh. on reddit um yep. and then if it gets a message back um it then um, unmarshals it and then it it uh, then tries to figure out what to do with it, right? So it gets uh -huh. a it gets a it gets an event, and then what it tries to do the first thing it tries to do is get the dev file. So it makes a call to Gitly. Uh, so it gets a, a project info. Um, it makes a call to Gitly to get some information, um, and then finally what it actually does here is it it will um, it'll update the status saying hey message received and things like that. Uh, but what's most important here is that it calls this pass def file function first. So the pass def file function, what it does is calls the def file library uh, to be able to take that information uh, from the def file and convert it to a deployment YAML, right? Um, so I'll, I'll get into this just quickly to show you what that is. Um, let me close this terminal because you don't need it. Um, so yeah, so it it basically what it's doing is it it's trying to figure out it's trying to get the Kubernetes components, which include uh, deployment, service, and ingress. Mm -hmm. And primarily what it's doing is it's using the def file library to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, and and uh, it's also like, the, there's some complexities here, like we create some init containers to inject the IDE. Basically injecting the IDE is as simple as taking the IDE binaries. Like for example, with Vim, we copy the Vim binaries, or if it's VS code, we take the VS code binaries and we just copy it from, what we have into the uh, container that's running so that you don't really need to have the ID installed in your container. We can install it for you, mm -hmm. right? So it does a very simple sort of copy um, function. Um, we also create uh, the containers. We mount volumes within that. Um, and then what we're really doing is um, creating a security context and some 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 random things there. Uh, readiness, pull probes, um, uh, and we are adding some deployment per parameters as well. It's more complex than I remembered, uh, but but we have we have added a, a few things there. But basically, if you see, um, it's finally what it's doing is calling the dev file generator to create a deployment, mm -hmm. passing in number of parameters of what the container should look like, init container should look like, etc. Mm -hmm. well, that all makes okay. sense. Yeah. Um, it's also generating services uh, from the dev file library, so it generates what services need to be exposed. And finally, it also generates ingress ingresses for this thing, right? Uh, based on the host and things like that. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit more complex. We needed to see whether they public, because a dev file can be a pretty complex thing. Uh, you need to see whether a path is publicly exposed to be able to expose the service completely and things like that. Um, so we're doing that, but basically in the end, we're just creating an ingress object uh, uh, and returning that. So um, at the end of this, so you get, we pass the dev file, we get uh, some objects from that. Uh, if I go back to server.go. Um, what you can see is that, um, so we pass the dev file, we get those objects. And then what we do is we pass a template. Um, and uh, so we've got this go template which decides how to render the, uh, how, what all objects should be applied. Mm -hmm. uh, let me show you that. So that's just a very simple uh, embed template here. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we've got, uh, you know, what are the things that should be created, like a persistent volume claim, service, uh, service for SSH. Yep, yep, yep. 
an ingress. So it's very simple. And then a bunch of objects from the dev files just applied. Mm -hmm. So very simple core template, which you can edit anytime um, to, to decide what object should be created. Okay. Um, and then finally, once we're doing that, we are then pushing that response to the uh, to the client, so to Agent K. So mm -hmm. the Agent K, we go and 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 say, hey, here's the um, can you please um, can you please uh, apply these changes? Um, I'll show you the Agent K side um, as well very quickly. So on the Agent K side, um, if you see, we've got this. Um, uh, so we, so it comes into the run context, right? So it, it starts running. It it tries to get the config. Uh, now there are a number of things we've included in the config. So um, if I what I didn't show you that time was a config of the workspace. So there are a few mm -hmm. things that we include. Um, so I've added a number of things to the config. So one is um you know what, what domain does this need to be exposed on what suffix for the domain needs to be given for every workspace because for each workspace we generate a new domain name um uh whether we should inject the auth proxy or not that's the authentication layer um which uh, this this is an interesting thing this is an, a redirect port for authentication uh we need to start an http um, server i'll explain that in more detail it, it does need a bit more explanation and then uh, a secrets as well. So we need secrets to be able to do, do authentication, like the client ID, client secret, and all those things. Um, so what what secrets are used as well? So so all that goes into the configuration. Um, uh, and and there are a few more uh, config uh, parameters which I'm, I don't think I've included all here. But but basically those config parameters um, uh, are, are used by the both the CAS uh, and element and the agent K element uh, to figure out what all to provision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going over this really quickly. It's, I, I think it's a bit complex, but, uh, you know, uh, Oh, it's fine. I think I'm following. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. It all makes um, sense so far. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, so we wait for the config to be found. Uh, so if the config is not found, um, we don't start the, uh, so if there's no remote dev config, we just don't, don't start anything. Right. <laughs> because, <laughs> excuse me, until the agent has, uh, has config, it doesn't make any sense. So once it's done, so once it does get the config, we start three things, okay? Um, the three loops we start is, the first one is just to uh, start getting work, right? So these are push elements coming in from, um, uh, from, from Rails, right? So Rails is telling us, hey, start this workspace, stop this workspace, whatever. So that's the core loop, right? We also start an HTTP server for authentication redirection. Um, and we need this because um, uh, because of uh, an issue with bile card URL. I'll explain that in more detail later. But we have to start a, a, an HTTP server as well. And then finally, what we do is also um, we start an informer. Uh, and I think uh, perhaps we, uh, we spoke about this briefly, but basically we're listening to keep Kubernetes events so that in case Kubernetes can't, cannot run the workspace or stops the workspace for whatever reason, we reflect the same status in Rails. Right. Um, and so we start that Kubernetes informer to be able to do that. Um, and informer is very simple. Um, should we go over? Let, let's go over the informer very quickly. Um, first, I suppose. Uh, but basically what it does is it, um, it creates a new shared informer and it only selects those deployments for which uh, the label matches the agent ID. So because mm -hmm. you could run more than one agent in a cluster, Yep. Right. Um, we want to make sure that they're only looking at those deployments that they manage. Right. And so um, we're labeling each of the deployments for the agent ID so that we know that, hey, this agent's only managing this deployment. So it only looks at those deployments mm -hmm. um, for status changes and things like that. Um, now, what we're doing as part of the informer is we do a resync. Um, so this is a this is a config parameter which is passed. Uh, what happens with this config parameter, uh, and it was not there in that repository I showed you, but basically if you do, if you set that config parameter, when the agent comes up for the first time, it'll sync all the workspace statuses with what's on the server. So let's say um, the agent went down for some time, but you want to make sure all the correct workspace statuses are reflected in, in Rails. What you can do is set this re resync all flag. So when it comes up, it will monitor all the deployment statuses from the cache. And it will then go and um, it will then go and update um, Rails with everything. So uh, this is just to make sure that the latest status is reflected in Rails if it go, goes out of sync or the agent goes down for some time for whatever reason. So um, Rails stores statuses in in database or something like that. 
Yeah, yeah. So it stores mm -hmm. the status of the deployment in the database. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things I had considered is that we could fetch using the same uh, publish mechanism, we could actually fetch the status in real time as well. So we could say, hey, give me the status. And then, you know, we could we could fetch the status in real time. But uh, I think just persisting it seemed simpler. I think, um, yeah, I think, I think decoupling that makes sense and then making it asynchronous is, is a good idea. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, the other thing we do is if a workspace has been terminated, we also look at those things. So if a workspace has been terminated, um, you know, you won't have any, you won't have any record of that in Kubernetes anymore because there's no, there's no workspace anymore. Agent has missed those events. And so we, we handle that as well. Um, by looking at what what are the uh, what are the running workspaces in in Rails, and so it it uh, reconciles those as well, um, and that's it. The, all the all the uh, all the informer really does is it uh, it you know checks for updates and deletes, and as as those updates and deletes come from Kubernetes, it just calls the status change function, which is a very simple function. All it does is it calls cast, and then cast calls an API to update Rails. <laughs> now we could have used um, I could have, I guess, directly called, um, you know, using that, uh, I, I saw that you had this GitHub, Git, uh, some helper thing. Um, yeah, GitLab access. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. GitLab access. I, I use that somewhere else. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I, I saw that much later. I suppose I could have called that. Uh, I am actually using it here for fetching existing workspaces. I use, uh, pull me back off and then, mm -hmm. Um, I'm using yeah. that, but not not for the status updates. But anyway, um, um, I suppose that's that's some refactoring we can do. Um, and then then the actual uh, work, uh, this is the main uh, work loop, right? So this is the informal loop that I showed you. And the last thing is this uh, get work loop. Um, what get work loop is doing is you know as soon as the agent starts up, um, what it needs to do is it needs to start getting work. Uh, but even before that, it needs to read some secrets, and the secrets contain information like, um, you know, what um, what is the client ID, client secret, which certs to use to uh, use HTTPS because the workspaces need to be able, to, you know, um, serve over HTTPS and things like that. So what it does is it firstly fetches the secrets when it comes up. Um, it uh, starts getting work from the server and starts that stream because it's a push, and then it keeps receiving uh, messages. Right, um, and in an endless loop. Uh, now, if the context closes, it will close this and stuff like that. That's different. But let's say it's running uh, successfully, it will get some work. It will check the type of event, and then mostly what it does is it doesn't apply uh, for like start or stop. Even for provision, it doesn't apply. But this there's little little differences in provision, and for destroy, the only difference is it destroys the whole namespace. So it just does a delete of the namespace so that everything is cleaned up. Um, in case of provision. What it does is um, uh, it it uh, you know it creates a new namespace. Um, it it creates the secret. So the secret information like it never leaves the cluster. So what we do is we uh, just in the config all we store is what is the secret, um, and then we just copy this information from the agent itself. So the the secret information never actually leaves the cluster. Like none of the client IDs, client secrets, or any of those things are traveling back to CAS. Um, so all we do is copy copy those secrets across. So the TLS secrets first, the certs and the key uh, to serve the workspaces over TLS. Um, uh, we create a cookie secret which is needed for the auth proxy, um, and then and then we we do a bunch of things like uh, the redirect URIs and uh, the whitelist domains and things like that. Those are also copied. So a bunch of things happen uh, in provision which are a bit different, and then finally it just applies um, and, and it applies that change. Um, and changes the state from provisioning to running once it applies complete. And I'll apply again is very, very simple. And I've, in fact, I used a lot of your GitOps code, uh, which was uh, using the uh, server-side apply, um, um, the SIG CLI apply, basically. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I, I basically copied a lot of that <laughs> shamelessly um, uh, because it, it, it made sense. Because um, mm -hmm. you got that whole inventory object going on as well, right? Uh, yep. So I... I I copy that as well. Um, and so, yeah, so things like that. Um, I think that's it. Uh, the only other part is this thing, which is start HTTP server. Uh, this is needed for authentication <laughs> redirection. Um, 
Okay. And uh, let me try to sort of show okay. you this. Um, I think I've got okay. a diagram somewhere of this because it's it's a Sorry, bit one, more one complex. Second. Sorry. No, no worries, dog. Uh, you know, it's it's early. It's early for you, late for me. So my my daughter just fell asleep, luckily. So, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so um, so so this is the sort of process and how um, redirection works in the IDE. So um, basically, when a user tries to access the IDE, we inject a sidecar onto the um, so every workspace. So if you saw, uh, there were two pods running, even though we had only one container, which is the Go container. We, we what we do is we actually inject a sidecar for every uh, thing. This does the actual authentication. Um, what it does is it checks the cookie. Um, if if I'm already logged in, then I don't need to um, do anything. So if the cookie is not present, it redirects to, uh, to GitLab. Uh, GitLab prompts the user for credentials. The user enters credentials. We redirect with auth code. Um, now this this is interesting. This redirect with auth code has to go to agent K. Now, the reason is that every um, uh, every workspace is served on a different domain. So, you know, you'll have, let, let's say, workspace 40 was workspace 40 at whatever, um, you know, uh, dot, dot, uh, local dev dot me or whatever. Um, and so every every uh, IDE is, is served on a different domain. And so because of that, we can't redirect to a cent, you know, there's no wildcard domains allowed in redirect URIs. So we need to redirect to a centralized place. So hence we redirect to agent K. So agent K serves this very small, lightweight HTTP server. And that HTTP server then um, figures out based on the state, which, which ID to actually, which workspace to actually um, redirect to. So it does that. And then finally, it's just standard OAuth after that. Uh, the the perhaps the most complex part was the fact that we had to redirect to the agent K um, to be able to do the 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 authentication. And this is also all ah, right. Okay, the domain and the TLS secret is in the cluster. So yeah, Correct. you have to you have to do it this way. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, and for that that's the only way I could figure out on on how to how to do it. Um, it is, I must admit, it is fairly complex to, to get this authentication flow working. Uh, but basically, that's what it is. It's a very simple Go server. It just uh, you know, starts an HTTP server. Um, it handles that redirect, looks at the state, and then just redirects to the correct host. Uh, so that's all it's doing. Um, so it's quite a simple sort of uh, server function. Um, that's it. We just handle context and nothing else. Um, so I think that that's about it. So there's not a lot going on. Like the agent case side is pretty generic. Um, you know, it just has three things, which is the apply loop, the uh, starting the HTTP server, and the uh, informer. And the server side is um, the server side. All it does is really uh, you know um, reads the def file, um, and it uh, from the def file it figures out uh, what it should look like. Uh, the the shape of the workspace and then generates the Kubernetes manifest and then applies them. So that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's that was it. It, was, it wasn't, wasn't that much, that much code. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So, so I wanted to talk to you about this, this part. I know this is a bit controversial in the sense that we're using this event-based mechanism where we're publishing and receiving. What do you think about that? I think uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, and uh, that's, I mean, um, I think that's, so I guess what, What's uh, how to say like different between uh, before and after is that currently cast doesn't have any uh, like persistent data in Redis. So if you destroy Redis and start from a clean slate, nothing valuable is destroyed. Yeah, and this is the first thing that would uh, introduce something that's pre precious <laughs> into the yeah. into Redis. 
<laughs> that's uh, true so so one of yeah. my plans is that uh from the rail side if if a workspace is stuck in a status for example let's say we we're expecting it to be provisioned and it got stuck in a provisioning state because maybe it was written to red redis and it was never picked up what we can do is we can re-trigger the event from the real side so that was one thing i was thinking of doing um yep then another thing is um as you probably know uh, with events it's uh, like edge triggered mechanism versus level triggered and kubernetes is level triggered so it's like declarative you say what did you want and then eventually that gets actuated and, and yeah. we with events it's like if you miss an event because this crashes or radius crashes or something goes wrong or network misbehaves then your finite automata becomes out of sync basically uh, so, yeah, so I think I think persisting the desired outcome, like desired state, and then if, like working to get there, is more robust approach. And so the way ideally, I see this is that we, we are persisting the desired state in Kubernetes. So we tell Kubernetes that hey, this is the desired state, and Kubernetes tries to make that happen. Right. So our desired state is hey, we want this service, this ingress, and this deployment. But the only thing is. That we need to tell, we need to give it when there are changes in state, we need to inform it, right? Um, till then it will it'll keep trying to do its desired state. So the only only difference is that we are triggering things to let it know, hey, now the workspace should be stopped or the workspace should be running or whatever. And then just um informing the desired state to Kubernetes. Kubernetes still makes the state happen and and decides what it needs to do with it, right? So it's still so, running the uh... same. Yeah, I'm talking. I was talking about the that uh, this stuff is persisted in Redis. So yeah, if I mean, what what would be an alternative uh, way uh, without? So I'll, several probably alternative ways. Um, so to be clear, I'm not saying this is like not good or anything. It's just like brainstorming. And you you asked, so yeah. I, I'm answering. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is kind of an indirect way to make an API call basically to agent yeah. K to make it do things. Yeah. We can just make that instead. So make an API call into agent K and uh, tell it to do stuff. Uh, or make a direct without, API. Without <laughs> Redis. Yeah. Yeah. Without Redis. If you like, you don't need the Redis basically here to temporarily persist data and then wait for agent k to pull it you can just uh so like with the kubernetes reverse proxy uh, we we accept an http call we make some processing we wrap it into a grpc stream and then we send it to a correct agent k by a reverse tunnel so Interesting. what what we could do here is we could <clears throat> use the uh, private API, private API server, the one that's uh, called by Rails, mm -hmm. do that transformation that CAS does, and then call that gRPC API of the agent K. Uh, Got it. Um, that makes sense. So, and then your your state will be persisted in in uh, you know in kubernetes interesting so so let me see where that is so you said it's in the reverse proxy uh, reverse so, tunnel is that correct you, you don't need to look at this part it's the internal plumbing you, you can just look at the as an example you know, the kubernetes api module uh the it's just the below one? no 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 uh module <clears throat> Mod module kubernetes api oh yeah, okay i see that this one yes so server uh, proxy uh, there's a lot of stuff here but basically uh, the interesting this is just plumbing all of that is like mm -hmm. massaging the incoming request then i think it's the proxy internal it's below then 
that's just authentication. Just go below. Get allowed uh, that's final, just authentication. Okay, authentication. No, that's all authentication. Then go. So this line one six nine. Mm -hmm. And that's basically make a request to uh, to the Kubernetes API. But you're doing that from CAS then? You're making an API uh, a request to the Kubernetes API from CAS, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> But then CAS needs Magic. to <laughs> Yes, it all works uh, via reverse reverse tunneling. So agent establishes a tunnel, then CAS finds another CAS, which has that tunnel, and then sends that traffic there. And then that, oh, that sends really it back cool. to uh, the agent. So you can just make gRPC calls to as, as if you are talking to the gRPC server running inside of an agent. And uh, you can route to different agents by putting agent ID in the metadata, which is one line above. <clears throat> this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can just call. So it's like they are equals. Agent can call CAS and CAS can call agent. But it must be doing this using Redis, right? How is it replicating this? <laughs> because it's one CAS needs doing, to find the other CAS. Yes, it's doing routing via Redis. but. Yeah. yeah, so it, it it is it will have to rely on Redis to figure out which is the right cache which is connected to that agent, right? Yes. But the data is not it doesn't need to be persisted there. It's 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 um, keep how to say keep being refreshed. So every n seconds each cache ensures that information about the connected uh, tunnels that it has is there and then and other cast can see that and you know, what it, what functionality is this used for so that I can just understand the whole It's used for the... Kubernetes API access. So when you access Kubernetes API from your CI job, yeah, uh, that's that goes through CAS, then goes okay. through another CAS, and then goes to the agent, and then the agent talks to the actual Kubernetes API. Okay, I'll have a look at this code. So it's almost like a synchronous request, and rather than exactly, uh, it is. It is. It's not persisting data anywhere. It is a synchronous request. Okay, so I can uh, I can definitely look at how this is done, so I could replicate the same. Yeah, um, this is one approach, and another approach is what I was talking about with uh, um, Chad. Chad, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah your your uh, uh, <laughs> people who do the same thing in the parallel universe <laughs> and kind of uh, so this is what i suggested to them uh, is persist the desired state in the database and then uh, uh, agent just fetches that through cast from the database got it Otherwise, everything is the same, basically. That's the only difference. And that's really not a... Uh... The... I have to say, uh, like, not a very important difference. Uh, like, we can, we don't need to, to have two implementations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything I'm... else, everything else Certainly... is very similar. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, we need to just like reconcile the two implementations. The, and the I other. know the other, and the, another difference is that uh, they use the provider uh, operator, operator and you use the yeah. library. Uh, yeah. So I think using the library is a better approach uh, because you don't, like user doesn't have to install anything. But uh, I know that they want to use the operator because it's more mature and more up to date and uh, other, I guess, benefits. And then that's also not a critical difference because they also, I think, my understanding is that they also would like to migrate to the library eventually. I mean, it's in everybody's interest because, especially in the user's interest, because that's less things to manage and that's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, 
so we've discussed the same things. And in fact, we are going to recon, you know, make sure so we 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 bring the code together. Um, I mean, the thing is, we were working on separate approaches. Um, but we are kind of converging on the same approach. Like once they reach a maturity, um, you know, we we'll sort of combine the the code anyway together, uh, and mm -hmm. probably we'll stick to their approach of polling for now, as long as that's um, effective. The only difference is like you know we'll have to keep the poll interval short because typically when users are like creating workspaces, they don't want to wait for too long, right? Absolutely. For the workspace to spin up. Yeah. Um, so the poll interval has to be pretty short. And that means that the polling loop has to be pretty effective as well. Um, yeah. so, uh, so I was I was suggesting to them to actually combine your approach with their approach uh, and mm -hmm. make Rails uh, send the message to CAS. And then it mm -hmm. would do what you did actually via, maybe not via a queue, but via a pub sub so that all yeah. CASs get it because queue is on the one receive, right? If, I, if I'm yeah. correct. Yeah. So then via PubSub, all classes can get that notification and uh, see if the agent, an agent is, uh, you know, waiting for a reply from, from class and then class can immediately fetch the data or refetch the data from Rails and reply to class. So that way we like eliminate the latency basically. And then polling yeah. can be actually infrequent to reduce the load and uh, as a safety mechanism, if that uh, poke <laughs> uh, to cast somehow doesn't work, uh, that mm -hmm. polling would still catch that uh, the, the, uh, you the, know, the, request yeah. and then it will work eventually after maybe, I don't know, one minute or something like that. So I think it's like Informer uh, does the watch, but also it releases objects. So it's yeah. the same uh, kind of watch plus safety released. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So watch plus cash. Yeah, exactly. Um, make, makes sense. <laughs> Interesting. I, I will think about that as well. Um, and then we get both of both, best of both worlds, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good approach to have both options um, you know, where, where in case you miss an event, you still have an option to go poll and, and get that event. Um, yeah, I think it's, okay. it actually solves the problems of, uh, like, you don't need to think very hard about what happens if this doesn't work, if that doesn't work. Like, yeah. they will just poll later and uh, eventually succeed if there was a transient failure in like a network or whatever. True. I mean, that that's uh, absolutely true. Um Okay, I, I I will I will I will think about that as well. Um, I'll also look into the synchronous uh, approach that you've got. I'll look deeper into the code to understand it a bit more, um, uh, which which looks pretty cool actually. So I'll I'll see how this is working. It it it, it feels like magic opening up a reverse tunnel and then being able to make uh, calls to <laughs> Kubernetes. So um, interesting. Um, the other thing um, I wanted to ask you, I, I don't know whether you have. Uh, just five more minutes of time um, is um, one of the things I, I want to support is the ability to stream logs from the workspace. Um, and the reason is, you know, the workspace may be misbehaving or something like that. So you may trigger off an ima image and the workspace may actually have some problems because of the image uh, or the ID is not starting up or something like that. So I want to be able to stream logs from the um from the workspace onto the uh, Rails UI, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things I was thinking of, which is not the best method, is to make this similar call, uh, synchronous call. Um, but I think that if if I have got this Kubernetes client, uh, which I can call from CAS, right, which, which talks to the agent, then I can actually just do a, a I'm guessing I can also do like logs and get the logs from a deployment using the same mechanism? Uh, I think uh, you will not need to do anything at all, basically. Well, only the UI. So uh, currently, Hodor is working on um, uh, making it possible to make Kubernetes API requests from the browser. So it's mostly authentication. Everything is there already except authentication. So he's working mm -hmm. on authentication and 
setting cookies and all of that. Uh, so once it's there, I think from the UI, you can just get the pods in that workspace via the Kubernetes API. And mm -hmm. then for each pod, call the slash logs endpoint and get the stream of logs. And all of that is in the front end. And all of that doesn't require any code in your module. So how um, so how will I so there's a WebSocket call to get logs? Is that correct? No, it's just an HTTP GET request and then a streaming response from the Kubernetes API server. So that is uh, a gRPC. Where is that exposed? So if I go to here, it's, is that yeah, it's that server. It's not a gRPC endpoint. It's just an HTTP endpoint of Kubernetes itself. So oh, I but see. we are I see. we are exposing all of the Kubernetes API in this Kubernetes API module. So got it, got it. the fr front end will be able to call that API basically and get get the logs. Okay, so I just call the logs endpoint for Kubernetes and then I can, from the Rails front end, I can, I can actually just uh, tail the yeah. logs. Yes, not yet, but once authentication is solved, yes. What is the authentication uh, issue? Sorry, I didn't understand that fully. Uh, we just need to set uh, the user's cookie on the cast domain, on the domain that exposes the oh, I see, API. I see. On the cast so domain. that cast can take the cookie, authenticate the request, and okay. pass it through. OK, so, so that's something you're working on. Is that correct? Yeah. There's okay. a, an epic, I think it's called front end access for Kubernetes or something like that. Got it. So that way you will just authenticate the user directly and then um, yeah. then cast can make the call. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You'll need to do authorization as well, right? To see whether the user has access to the that agent or project or whatever. And... Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's part of yeah, authenticate and authorize. Yes. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, that was it all, Mikhail. Thank you for your feedback. Um, I am going to have a look uh, a bit more deeper into, into some of this code. Um, it was really useful uh, for me. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the chat. And um, that's that's uh, really cool uh, to see this uh, happen. I'm really looking forward to uh, So I just tried uh, the web editor several times, and uh, it's it's excellent. And uh, yeah. this this like stuff would be even better, and that's like it feels like you you feel the evolution of how how people develop when you see such things. It's really cool. I think. Thank you for working on it. No, thank you. Um, all right. Um, that that's pretty much it. I'll let you get along with your day. Uh, thank you so much, Mikhail. Cheers.